when something happens, I ask people, what would justice look like for you in this situation? That's coming from an empathetic space. I don't all, I don't think like, oh yeah, you should do this and you do that. I don't do that. I step up and say, okay, I understand you were harmed. What would justice look like for you? Don't think about how systems work or none of that. For you and for you to be whole again, what does that look like? And sometimes people say, I don't know. I'm patient enough to allow them to come up with their own solution and support that. That's what empathy looks like in this work. He's a public speaker, a husband, a father, a taxpayer. You think about this. And a college professor in the field of criminal justice. Yeah, I am in a position where I can teach. I can do all of these things, but I'm always, it always goes back to, oh, but he has a record. Or, you know, he was convicted of something. He's a felon. It always goes back to that, but it's like, you know, when do I get different labels? My name is Jason Soule, and we're in the building of the Milwaukee Turners. Now I'm in a position where I'm a professor, I'm a husband, I'm a father, I'm a community member and I just show up for people. You know, that's pretty much my story. I'm a humble servant. I'm the co-founder of Humanize My Hoodie. Humanize My Hoodie, Hoodie was birthed from a Facebook post. I said, I'm teaching this semester wearing a hoodie for all my classes. And I said, I hope my threat perception of black men in hoodies goes down for my students, because a lot of them gonna be cops, a lot of them gonna be probation officers. So teaching them criminal justice, that's an abolitionist framework, because I'm formerly incarcerated. We brought academia, but we brought streets, and I just said, humanize my hoodie, hashtag. It didn't, I didn't think about it. I was making the post, put my family in the picture, stack my books up, held on a Black Lives Matter hoodie. It just resonated. People felt it. And my friend Andre, he was already in the fashion stuff and doing shows and all of that. That's the best part in all of this because the unity of me and him, it's good to see two friends from childhood put something together that the world is feeling. Like, that's amazing. We did New York Fashion Week. Our foot action partnership has us in over 100 stores right now. To be able to partner like that, it's like, I dreamed of stuff like that in prison. We get to move the culture, and for that, like I said, I'm grateful because it was a time where my sister, my brother, my mom, all my family just didn't know if I was gonna make it. From Chicago, um, 1978, born in the war on drugs, and um, hit my community hard. Uncle went to prison, father got hooked on heroin. I became a soldier in the streets and got caught with a gun, got shot, probation officers all on me, choked, thrown, like shackled, been through the flames. When I came home from prison, I started studying criminal justice. And by studying the system, I realized that the system was criminal. Freedom School gave me my first job working with kids after prison. That was 2005. I went through Ella Baker training for seven days in Tennessee. They gave me a chance, you know? They didn't look at me as a gang leader in the movement. They just said, hey, you can serve this role and you can do this, you can train folks. It was important for me to understand, like, where are my gifts? Teaching criminal justice made sense. Facilitating restorative justice in prisons, in communities in California, in Texas. You know, I travel the country showing other people that there's another way to actually have justice. I'm creative in my ability to understand we got enough intellect, we got enough art, we got enough science within our own communities to figure it out. You don't need police. You don't need people policing other people's bodies. You need healthy people. We need to like acknowledge the people we drive past every day holding signs. It should be a response. Somebody should be able to interact with them and get them the services they need. So as an abolitionist, I'm just cutting out all that red tape and saying, hey, we see a problem there. Do we have three or four people that can help tend to this? What does mutual aid look like for this group of folks? So it's just really us reclaiming our power again, saying, wait a second, why did we think that it was 911 or nothing. If Harriet Tubman can free slaves and she ain't have no Snapchat, she didn't have <laughs> she didn't have any of this stuff. She couldn't DM nobody or none of that. If she could do that, come on, man. I know what I can do. I know what you can do. I know what everybody can do. Cause like they gave us a blueprint for some reason. 
we got lost in our day-to-day -day and everyday stuff where we didn't look at the blueprints that was left from the people of the past. I'm trying to really have freedom in this world. I don't think we really know what being free is. I don't think as a people we really think about that, you know, and it's like I'm chasing freedom and I mean freedom of my body, freedom of my expression, freedom, you know, just true freedom. And I'm still trying to figure out what that looks like for myself, but I want everybody to understand what liberation and freedom feels like. I believe in me. Like, do you believe in you? That's what I'm trying to get people to understand. So I took some hard sacrifice and put my family in uncomfortable situations for my morals and principles. So I'm grateful to be standing on the right side of history. Cause when you actually doing it, you know, you looked at it as radical, but 20, 30, 40 years from now, they don't look at you as, as radical and you like appreciate it. They didn't respect Muhammad Ali until he got way older. But while I'm here, you know, I'm gonna fight the good fight. And if that means me being detained or harmed or oppressed, it's like I'm sacrificing for the people.